In this scene from A New Hope, R2-D2 rolls into an escape pod with C-3PO in tow. R2 enters the pod and C-3PO, not understanding R2's plan and not at all wanting to get in with him, tells R2 to get out of the pod and quit screwing around. And then this happens. That blaster shot just misses 3PO's resting frame and he quickly decides that yeah, the escape pod is a good idea. It's a moment of humor, but also a moment that sets the rest of the trilogy on its path. If 3PO doesn't get into the pod, or they both are captured or worse killed, the movie plays out dramatically differently, as does the rest of the trilogy. The story as we know it can't exist. But what if I told you this was the guy that fired one of the most important shots in Star Wars history? It's he Jimmy dead ran off, but the droids are over there. Oh, no. I'm going to regret this. In this non-canon environment where Buford's blaster misfires and sends 3PO into the pod, setting the story on its way. This was supposed to be a fun Star Wars crossover episode of a show that never takes itself seriously. Instead, it almost accidentally became one of the greatest pieces of Star Wars entertainment to come out of Disney since they purchased it. Crossovers are almost a ubiquity in television. Robot Chicken, Family Guy, Star Wars is maybe the king of the crossover. I recently made a video for this channel titled, How Phineas and Ferb Did the Impossible. And as I was revisiting the show for that video, I rewatched the season four Star Wars crossover. And I quickly realized that this episode, or series of episodes, is maybe one of the best crossover episodes in modern television. It starts with how it recontextualizes its source material, Star Wars. Instead of taking the easy way out, which many do, and taking jabs at the series' biggest moments by recreating them and putting their own slant on them, instead, it does something you rarely see. It adds context to those moments, and it does so with an approach that's probably more elevated than what you would expect from a Disney show. This Star Wars special takes strange inspiration. The writers of the show were inspired by Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead a play that explores what minor characters in Hamlet are doing when they aren't on stage. As Michael Liven pointed out in his review, in Star Wars Phineas and Ferb, it's an exploration like Rosencrantz of what happens in the films in the moments the camera misses, like Buford's blaster shot. Phineas and Ferb creator Dan Pobenmeyer told the Huffington Post that they wanted to leave Star Wars alone and just have the characters kind of bump into each other. So over the course of 50 minutes, we find out that in this shot, there's actually a farm just off camera where Phineas and Ferb live. We learn that as R2-D2 is making his way through the desert here, he actually loses the Death Star plans. Hey, what's this? Death Star plans? Wait, I bet it belongs to that R2 unit that we sent to Ben Kenobi's house. And Phineas and Ferb help him relocate them. Again, keeping the trilogy on track. We see what happens after moments like these. We don't revisit Star Wars as we know it, we learn more about it. We see new pieces of it. We see a galaxy and characters that exist within it, not because of it. And this makes the special far more interesting than what we normally see in these kinds of crossovers. But it takes it one step further. Uh, it's like it's got a self-destruct button. What kind of idiot would design that? Writing one of these kinds of specials is hard. Writing a piece of Star Wars fiction is clearly even harder. Again, to revisit the impossible piece that I made a few weeks ago, Phineas and Ferb is a show that is so well written and nuanced that it's reasonable to believe that the writers could handle transplanting the characters into a different sort of world. They do. The Star Wars special tells an entirely new Star Wars story, one that's separate from the film's plot, and it attempts to fill in blanks that the films create. It isn't a retelling, necessarily. A big plot line is what day-to-day -day life for a regular stormtrooper is like. We get to see how public transportation in space works. We get a plot line about one of Han Solo's rival pilots in Isabella. We even get to see what it's like for people that have to bring Vader food and who may or may not mess up his order. I find your lack of sauce disturbing. <laughs> Importantly though, it manages to tell a great Phineas and Ferb story within this world. It knows what it is. It is still Phineas and Ferb, and it doesn't leave behind its identity. You get your Perry plotline, Doofenshmirtz's big plan, Candace trying to catch the boys. It doesn't fold itself into a structure that it isn't meant to fit in. It doesn't change what it knows works. It's more than just fan service. It has identity, which is more than you might be able to say for the current mainline films at times. It's confident in its characters and its story, and it shows. The goal is to create a great Phineas and Ferb story. It rather unintentionally becomes a great and new Star Wars story. But there's one more area where it's surprisingly special. It knows just how absurd Star Wars, the space opera, can really be. You know, I'm thinking about getting a saxophone. Yeah, good for you. 
This is the Imperial Credit Union. It is a bank of sorts for the Empire. And this moment where Perry and Doofenshmirtz fight inside of it kind of exposes what makes Star Wars interesting that isn't always addressed. This is a universe of real people, people that live regular lives. They aren't all Jedis and pilots. And there are organic stories to tell that aren't quite as dramatic as the films make them, but are interesting and broach the same themes and kinds of relationships. And they don't care about what they touch in the process. Candace is saved by Phineas, and she develops a better understanding of the humanity she's fighting against. A stormtrooper being helped by a rebel, or an eventual rebel, just like Rey and Finn. Ferb quickly turns on Phineas and becomes kind of Darth Maul, family turned against one another, like Han and Kylo. It develops these characters and in again just 50 minutes, injects the same patterns of drama as the films, but like good crossovers should, it amps the absurdity of the already absurd up a thousand levels. Here's the moment Darth Maul reveals his saber. <laughs> And here's what this moment leads to. Here's the Death Star one tiny flaw of a whole moment, further exposed for its narrative ridiculousness. Disney, to their credit, let the writers expose some of the formulaic and, for lack of a better word, less nuanced pieces of Star Wars. It didn't let insecurity halt creativity. Phineas and Ferb was always written as a show for adults that could also be enjoyed by kids, as its creators have said. And it plays with the flaws of its source material, and as a result, a great film franchise, Star Wars, gets a great non-canon supplement that does what it does differently. Seriously, why don't they put safeties on these blasters? Sorry, my bad! Hey, don't worry about it! To be clear, there are these moments. Buford can't shoot straight, and that's a play on the film's stormtroopers that are usually inaccurate. But here, it's just because Buford's an idiot. But for every one of these moments, there's a genuinely interesting and well-written moment like the escape pod. A good crossover maintains the identity of the underlying show, tells its own story, and is fearless in its use of the source material and in playing off of and within the flaws of that source material. A good Star Wars story, however, is much more unique. And somehow, Phineas and Ferb of all things manages to bring you into this universe better than almost anything outside of canon has in years. It invites you into a world you know and shows you more. Dan Pavemeyer and Swampy Marsh wanted to create something great that could stand up within this universe and in the process they maybe accidentally created something that is in some ways better space battle over that way certainly not you know your mission to find socks for lord vader yes sir socks this is a total waste of my potential ah not me this is about where i peak That is it for today's episode of Nerdstalgic. If you enjoyed the video, press the like button down below. Also, if you haven't yet done so, press subscribe. That way you don't miss anything I put out on this channel. Also, next to the subscribe button is a little bell, that notification bell. If you press it, just make sure you're actually notified when I upload. This platform has a bad habit of not showing you those things, so that notification bell helps a lot. And as always, on your screen right now are two more episodes of Nerdstalgic. I think one of them should be my Phineas and Ferb video about it doing the impossible from a couple of weeks ago. So you can click on either of those to see more of what I've done recently, and I will see you guys in the next video.